Welcome back everyone to day two of the December Council meeting, which is also being held jointly with Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Uh, we have some un well, not, I shouldn't say we have some unfinished business. The board has some unfinished scup business. And with that, Nicola, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we just need to pick up on the discussion that we we're having at the end of yesterday. Um, about the implications of the joint motion that opened up federal waters from January through April, which will go into effect once filed, the intent is January 1st. But as it stands, uh, New Jersey through Massachusetts do not have their state waters open or approval from ASMSC to do so. So if there is interest in those states reopening January through April, um, as soon as they can next year, we would need a board motion to approve. So the alternative is that we um, wait till the February meeting where states will bring forward their proposals for the 10% reduction and include if they so choose to be open through January through April. And that would be part of your, your RDM analysis. Um, I think the downside to taking an action today to allow states to, to um, open maybe a few weeks earlier is that a state has to do two administrative processes to change the rules twice. Um, so I will look to the board to see if there is interest to accelerate the process with a motion today that would enable them to open up potentially um, in some part of, of wave one or wave two. But if there's not interest, then then we'll just carry forward with our approach of the technical committee meeting and a board meeting sometime in February to approve proposals. Adam Walski. Absent state proposals for 2024 today, which I don't think any of the aforementioned mass through New Jersey states are prepared to put forward. Right. What would be the other time frame when the board would approve them, if not in early February, when we're doing the rest of the rec measures for the year? You know, what 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 would a motion even look like potentially? Uh, so that would have to occur today, and a motion would look something like allowing states to open up January through April, twenty twenty three, um, contingent upon you know putting those that opening in their RDM analysis for 2024. So states would be able to leave this, this meeting and begin their rulemaking process to open up January 1 or sometimes after, depending on how quickly a state can act. If we don't do that today, you have to wait until after the mid-February meeting when proposals are brought forward and then that clock starts for a state to implement measures. So there's clearly interest from the state of New Jersey to open as early as possible. That's, I'm just confident of that. I'm just trying to think about what the reality is though. And again, I'm speaking for New Jersey. We'd love to hear from other states as well. We've got a New Jersey Marine Fisheries Council that would have to meet. Um, we'd probably want to meet with our advisors. Uh, we'd have these regulations. We'd have to run them through the RDM. Uh, we would then have to get them approved by our DEP. I'm not sure any of this could realistically occur until sometime in February. So again, speaking for New Jersey anyway, and our administrators nodding next to me here. So I've been a proponent of this opening. I, from what I heard, the service intends to move forward with the opening in federal waters. Now it's just going to come down to how quickly we can get things done. Um, I don't see us getting something done in Jan in, in New Jersey until something in February anyway. And at that point, I know you, I keep hearing the January to April time frame, but we would have the ability in approving the measures by the board in February. It would basically happen as soon as students, states could move after that anyway. So if a state's looking at not being able to realistically accomplish something until February anyway, 
I'm not sure where the advantage is going to come for a state like New Jersey here, I, I think is where I'm at. As much as I wanted to see it done at January 1st, I just don't see that in administrative reality. I don't see the benefit in doing the double the work. Um, but I think it's not leaving here without a motion today does not mean January through April is closed. I think it means you're looking at, at least for a state like New Jersey, a mid-February opening at the earliest once the board approved those measures and our state was taking action. So we're not foregoing four months. We're saying the next six weeks is probably not realistic, if, if, if that sounds right. Sounds accurate to me, yes. Jeff? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just I was in support of what Adam was saying. Um, our council does meet on uh, Thursday, January 4th, so potentially we could take some initial action that early um, in support of uh, opening in the winter. John? So speaking for New York, uh, certainly some some level of interest in this opening. A lot of the same process issues that Adam just raised would apply to New York. And so if we were to move forward with opening, it would be sometime in late February, March at the earliest for us. So seeing no motion for alternative action, we will be waiting until the February meeting to approve um, proposals from the states. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting us get back to that issue this morning. Um, excuse me. I've had my hand up online. This is Emerson Hasbrook before we leave this. Apologies. Uh, go ahead, Emerson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am not opposed to having a winter scup fishery. I, I would support having a winter scup fishery. However, um, in light of some of the discussion that we had yesterday about um, accounting for um, uh, recreational harvest during that time period, if states are going to come back to the board with a proposal at least from my perspective, I would only support proposals that detail um, how how that harvest information is going to be collected um, during the uh, that offshore winter fishery. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Emerson. Uh, with that, we are completely done with stuff. Anything else? Anna. Okay. With that, let's go to our first agenda item for today. Uh, the council board will adopt the 2024 recreational management measures for black sea bass. Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning, Julia. So this is Julia with council staff. I'm going to cover. Most of the presentation on this and um, Tracy with the commission is going to cover part of it related to the Virginia um, February recreational fishery. Clicker challenges. Um, Stephen, can you go to the next slide while I try to figure this out? Thanks. OK, it's working now. Um, so the presentation and decisions are somewhat similar to the decisions made yesterday for summer flounder and scup, except that um, one nuance for black sea bass is that we're um, only looking at measures for 2024 as opposed to for two years for the other two species. And I'll explain why on later slides. Um, but first we'll review recent fishery performance information, review the monitoring committee recommendations for 2024 recreational measures, review AP input, and then recommend either conservation equivalency or coastwide management and associated measures for 2024. And then there's the potential for a board only discussion of the Virginia proposal for the February 2024 recreational fishery, which um, Tracy will get into more detail on. Um, so just a reminder about the kind of general steps in the process that today the council and board will be asked to adopt 
the overall percent change in harvest needed for 2024, and the approach to federal waters measures in 2024. And for federal waters measures, the decision is to either waive the federal waters measures in favor of state waters measures or to use coastwide measures. So this is similar to the decisions made for summer flounder each year. And then early next year, the state waters measures um, will be determined through the commission process. So just a little bit on background of some high level trends in recent fishery performance. Um, the most recent complete year of data that we have is 2022. This slide shows recreational harvest in millions of pounds by state over the past 10 years. So if you focus on 2022, um, it was about 8.34 million pounds, which was, you can see a decrease from 2021. 2021 was 11.97 million pounds, but you can also see that 2021 was a, a high year for this time series. And 2022 is more in line with years prior to 2021. Um, you can also see from the slide that on average over the recent few years, New York has accounted for the greatest proportion of the total recreational black sea bass harvest in weight, followed by New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, and North Carolina in that order. Um, as Kylie and Hannah mentioned yesterday, for current year data, we currently have um, preliminary data through wave four, so through August. That preliminary estimate for black sea bass is 4.86 million pounds, which is the lowest wave one through four estimate since 2014. However, it's not dramatically lower than recent year estimates. Um, it's only 15% below the 10 year average. So it is a bit of a decrease, um, but not a huge decrease. And the figure on the slide here shows just the wave one through four estimates um, for the past 10 years, including the preliminary estimate for this year, so you can again, you can see that it's uh, it's lower than some recent years, but it's not dramatically lower than the time series shown on the screen here. It's also important to note that over the past ten years, <clears throat> waves one through four harvest have accounted for anywhere from fifty-two to sixty-nine percent of the annual harvest. <clears throat> so this only gives us a limited ability to predict the full year twenty twenty-three harvest. It can just give us kind of a preliminary look at things. Um, it's also important to keep in mind when considering the um, decrease in um, preliminary wave one through four harvest that all of the states um, did make their measures more restrictive in 2023 with the goal of achieving a 10% reduction in harvest as required by the percent change approach. So this shows the measures by state that were implemented for 2023. You can see that there's a lot of variability across states and even within states in several cases. There's some cases of states having different measures for different modes or different seasons throughout the year. You can also see that the minimum size limit is um, a lot more restrictive, New York and North compared to New Jersey South. In 2023, the federal waters measures were waived. So these measures on the screen here were the only measures impacting harvest. Um, so, as discussed yesterday for summer flounder and scup, um, we need to use the percent change approach to set measures for these species. And the first step in the percent change approach is to think about if this year's measures, so the measures shown on the screen here, if these were remained in place next year, what do we think um, harvest would be next year? And we include a confidence interval around that estimate to account for uncertainty in that estimate, and we compare it to the RHL. So that's the first column under the percent change approach, the one that's in dark blue there. And again, um, we are now using the recreation demand model or the RDM to come up with these estimates because we think it's the best tool available. Um, it was discussed yesterday in detail. Um, we, it's made a lot of advances in our ability to predict harvest under different management measures. So the RDM estimate of if we left this year's measures in place next year, the Median projected harvest value is 8.4 million pounds. And the confidence interval around that, based on the monitoring committee's recommendation for how you define the confidence interval, is 7.72 to 9.08 million pounds. This is compared to the 2024 RHL of 6.27 million pounds. So you can see that the harvest estimate confidence interval is entirely above the RHL, which puts us in that bottom right um, category for the RDM. So the next step 
um, sorry, under the percent change approach, I said RDM. Um, the next step in the percent change approach is to consider uh, the biomass category. And for black sea bass, the 2021 management track assessment remains the most recent information available. Um, unlike the other two species that were discussed yesterday, we did not get a management track assessment for black sea bass this year. So our most recent estimate of um, the biomass compared to the target level is still coming from that 2021 management track assessment, which used data through 2019. And according to that assessment, biomass was estimate, estimated at 210% of the target level, which puts black sea bass in the very high category under the percent change approach. So the combination of that um, confidence interval to RHL comparison and then the biomass category puts us in the 10% reduction um, category for black sea bass, which is, this is the same categorization that SCUP was in. Another thing to think about is the accountability measures um, to think about, do we need to do anything in addition to what the percent change approach says? Um, as Hannah discussed yesterday, the accountability measure comparison is the most recent three-year average of recreational dead catch compared to the recreational ACLs. And the numbers on the screen here are from a letter provided by Garfo. And you can see that that most recent three-year average shows a 64% overage. Um, given that biomass is above the target, the regulations say that adjustments to measures will be made, taking into account the performance of the measures and the conditions that precipitated the overage. However, as Hannah discussed yesterday for SCUP, in this letter that Garfo sent to the council, the agency indicated that no additional action is required in 2024 to address the recent overages that were part of the um, accountability measure comparison. And the rationale for this is that there were reductions implemented for 2023. Like I previously said, the states restricted their measures with um, the goal of achieving a 10% reduction in harvest. And 2023 does not factor into that um, AM comparison because we don't have final data for 2023 yet. Um, and then also the letter cited improvements made to the recreation demand model, which will be used for setting management measures for 2024. So although an AM has been triggered, um, Garfo has indicated that we don't need to do anything addition in response to it, which was similar to SCUP yesterday. So I wanted to explain a little bit more about the timing of the stock assessment for black sea bass, um, because this is somewhat of a special situation and it um, is part of the um, monitoring committee recommendation for measures next year. Um, it's important to think about the percent change approach intended to set measures for two years at a time in sync with the setting of catch and landings limits in response to updated stock assessment information. And last year was the first year that we used the percent change approach, and that was an interim assessment year. So measures were set for just 2023 with the goal of setting 2024 to, and 2025 measures based on a 2023 management track. So at the time that we set 2023 measures for Black Sea Bass, we thought that we'd be sitting here today in the same situation that we're in for our summer flounder and scup, where we would have a new management track assessment and we could set two-year measures at this meeting. However, the 2023 management track was subsequently delayed to 2024. Um, this was related to the ongoing research track assessment and the peer review date for that got shifted, which impacted the timing of the management track assessment. So this was discussed in August in terms of how this impacts the RHL. Um, so we did not have updated stock assessment information, but we did have three new years of catch data that factored into the calculations for discards that are used to derive the RHL. So in, during the August meeting, the council and board um, set the RHL so that everything was the same as 2023, except for the discards calculations were updated. And that resulted in about a 5% decrease in the 2024 RHL compared to 2023. Um, and so when we think about we have a new RHL that's different from the 2023 RHL, but we don't have updated stock assessment information. And the framework and addenda that implemented the percent change approach did not contemplate a situation where the RHL would change without updated stock assessment information. That action just assumed that we would always have those two pieces of information available at the same time was assumed that we would get management track assessments um, every other year for all three species. Um, but then later there was this change in the assessment schedule that um, kind of created a bit of a, a gray area in terms of the percent change approach in terms of what are we supposed to do when we have updated information for column one, but not okay. for okay. 
Yeah. It has, like, different gears. Considered all well, I think it's total it. catch it across all <laughs> gears, I think. Um, the if you're online, please mute your phones. Somebody's bleeding through to the meeting. Thanks. So the monitoring committee talked about those um, timing considerations. And um, they talked about if the 2023 and 2024 RHLs had been available for setting identical measures across 2023 and 2024, if we had known last year that we weren't going to get a management track assessment this year, then, and, and if we had known what the 2024 RHL was going to be, um, because the 2024 RHL is only 5% different than the 2023 RHL, um, then the percent change approach calls for averaging two year RHLs. It would have put us in the exact same box that we were in last year anyway. It would have resulted in the same 10% reduction as was implemented for 2023. And this was discussed a little bit yesterday that when, when the percent change approach is used to set measures for two years at a time, and it requires, so in this case, for example, a 10% reduction, you're not taking 10% in one year and then another 10% in the second year that you're setting your two-year measures. If you're able to set two-year measures, in this case, if it's a 10% reduction, you take it the first year and then you leave measures alone in the second year. So if we had been able to um, know what the 2024 RHL was last year, um, the same measures implemented for 2023 would have also applied to 2024. The monitoring committee also noted that there's no status quo option for stocks in the very high biomass category under the percent change approach. So regardless of what um, row you fall under, um, there's the only options are a liberalization or a restriction for stocks in the high, the very high biomass category. There's no status quo option. Some monitoring committee members thought they would be um, especially comfortable with status quo for stocks in this high biomass category. Um, because it's less risky than at lower biomass levels. They also had a pretty in-depth discussion about um, the decisions made for 2024. If there's if they if there was a recommendation for status quo as opposed to if a 10% reduction is taken, what would be the likely impact of that on 2025? So they talked about if we take a 10% reduction now, does that decrease the chances that we'll need another reduction next year? Does it increase the chances that we could even liberalize next year, as opposed to if we keep status quo now, does that increase the chances that we'll need a, another reduction next year? And ultimately they decided that it's not possible to make any predictions along those lines because we'll have new information available to us when we set the 2025 measures. So a big change will be um, some changes to the assessment model. I already mentioned that there's a, a research track assessment that was um, just peer reviewed last week actually. And um, it's intended that the management track assessment in June of next year will be based on um, the model that is approved through the research track. So that will, it's expected that will change the modeling framework. Um, and then between now and the management track assessment, it will add multiple new years of data. The biological reference points could change. Um, and then addition, every time we think about setting new measures, we are planning to rerun the recreation demand model. So that'll incorporate new information. So for all those reasons, there's just too many unknowns in terms of a decision that we make today, how that will impact 2025. And when we get to setting 2025 measures, we will use an updated assessment, an updated run of the recreation demand model, and we'll use the best information available to us at the time. But right now, the monitoring committee thought it was important to just focus on what's most um, appropriate for 2024. They also noted that if status quo is not used in 2024, the likely outcome would be changes in black sea bass recreational measures each year from 2022 through at least 2025, just based on the timing um, of the spec cycles and the assessment updates. They noted that annual changes do not align with the goals of the percent change approach and frequent changes and measures can lead to frustration and non-compliance um, among anglers. So for all those reasons, the monitoring committee recommended status quo measures in 2024. This would essentially mean treating 2024 as the second year in a two year cycle with 2023. They agreed that this aligns with the intent of the percent change approach to provide stability in measures and to update measures in sync with the timing of updated stock assessment information. And again, just to emphasize that 2025 measures will be set based on updated information 
including an updated stock assessment. Um, and then as part of that status quo recommendation, the monitoring committee re recommended continuing to waive the federal waters measures through conservation equivalency with the same non-preferred coastwide and precautionary default measures as were used for 2023. Um, so I'm not gonna get into detail of that, but on the screen here is just showing what those measures are. Again, this is the same process as for summer flounder where the non-preferred coastwide measures are written into the federal regulations, but then waived in favor of the state waters measures. So we took all that to the AP and asked for their input. Um, there's more detail in the AP meeting summary, but just some high level points from their input is that multiple AP members expressed frustration that the measures cannot be liberalized for black sea bass, given that biomass is so high. One advisor said that the overages are driven by biomass. There's just so many black sea bass out there that um, it's just causing the harvest to be so high. Um, I think a few advisors said that the cuts in summer flounder would be more palatable if the scuff and black sea bass measures could be liberalized. One advisor said that the harvest in 2023 may be lower than anticipated due to restrictions that were implemented during the peak season. One advisor said that the monitoring committee's justification for status quo should be used to justify a liberalization. Um, one advisor noted that um, due to black sea bass's um, life history, as you increase the minimum size limits, that has a disproportionate impact on male black sea bass. And one advisor said that measures should be liberalized to reduce discards so anglers can catch their limits um, quicker uh, with fewer discards. And for example, this advisor cited that um, this advisor is from New York where there's a 16 and a half minimum size, which creates a lot of discards. Uh, we had a few additional comments um, over email. Um, one individual who provided an email comment expressed concern about uh, the high discards of undersized fish from party and charter boats when they're fishing at depths of greater than 100 feet. Um, one advisor provided a detailed comment about the different regulations um, that are that apply in Long Island Sound, depending on if you're fishing on the New York side or the Connecticut side. This advisor thought that those regulations should be more aligned and that um, the New York regulations could con could be have a distinct set of regulations for Long Island Sound as opposed to the rest of New York to help create um, greater alignment with the Connecticut regulations. Um, and then another comment said that the minimum size should be re reduced to reduce discards. And then Tracy is going to cover the next two slides um, on the Virginia February fishery. Thanks, Julia. So for this year, um, Virginia has proposed the option to consider either status quo recreational black sea bass fishery for February um, 1st through 29th, 2024, or no February recreational fishery in 2024, pending the state's public comment and hearing process and a decision by the Virginia Marine Resources Commission in January 2024. So if the decision is for a status quo approach, then Virginia will do the following. Um, they'll use 2023 measures or more restrictive, um, which last year was a 13 inch minimum size limit and then no more than a 15 fish bag limit. Um, Virginia will also use the same process for monitoring landings as they've done in the past for fast February fisheries, um, which occurred from 2019 to 2021 and then again this year in 2023. Um, this is to ensure accurate characterization of the um, 2024 February fishery. And so this will um, include that any vessel fishing for black sea bass must have a permit, um, which comes with two reporting requirements. First, each vessel must hail the VMRC Marine Police Operations st Station at the start of the trip. Um, to let staff coordinate meeting some vessels at the dock when they land to count the number of fish and obtain biological data. Um, and in addition, permit holders must report to VMRC uh, information on the trip, such as number of black sea bass kept and release. And then VMRC uses this data collected from the reporting requirements to get an estimate of total landings and pounds. So then lastly, once that um, possible February 2024 harvest has been calculated, the proposed adjustments to the 2024 season um, to account for Virginia's February harvest will go 
through Virginia's public comment and hearing process, and then they'll submit a proposal with the proposed adjustments to the TC for review. So overall, the monitoring committee, technical committee, and advisory panels had no concern with Virginia's proposal. Um, one note to make, though, at the AP meeting, a council member who was also a for hire captain in Virginia said that he believed that a majority of the for hire fleet in Virginia would also like um, would like to do away with a special February opening. Um, the payback required late in the year, um, the fishermen in Virginia believe has become too large and it doesn't feel worth it. So to assist with your discussion today, I just wanted to provide the board with what Virginia's season would be like if a February fishery is not approved this year um, and black sea bass recreational management measures remain status quo. So in the table, I have the option selected by Virginia earlier in this year that was approved by the board at their March 2023 webinar meeting highlighted. Um, so you can see the 13 inch minimum size limit, 15 fish back limit, and then it dates of an open season from May 15th through July 15th, and then July 27th through um, December 31st. So below the table, I have provided what Virginia's actual 2023 black sea bass season was once they adjusted for 2023 February harvest. Um, this is about 2020, 22 days taken off the original season to account for that 2023 February harvest. And so this is an example of what their season might be adjusted to, something similar to this, um, if a Virginia February fishery is approved. Um, so I will now hand the presentation back to Julia to summarize the discussion points for this. Day. Thanks. Um, just to kind of recap the decisions um, that we're asking the council and board to make today. Um, there should be a decision on the percent change in harvest required under the percent change approach, and then a decision between using conservation equivalency to waive federal waters measures or coastwide measures for 2024. And if the decision is to go with conservation equivalency, then um, the council and board need to recommend non-preferred coastwide and precautionary default measures. And again, the monitoring committee recommendation for all of those things is status quo measures in 2024. Um, so there's we have a draft motion for that, which include continuing to use conservation equivalency with the same measures for 2024. The goal would be just that, um, that all measures are just left unchanged. And then um, again, there could be the board um, discussion about the Virginia February fishery. So with that, I think um, Tracy and I are happy to take questions. Thank you, Julian, Tracy. Uh, before we get into motions or anything, are there any questions? Adam? Just confirming that we will do a management track assessment for black sea bass in 2024. And then we will do another one in 2025, which will then bring it back in sync with our other rec species. That's the intent, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I would just say that's the intent right now, but over the past two years, timing of assessments has changed a lot. And I feel like we had some challenges where last year we said we were definitely gonna get an assessment and then we didn't. So I'm like, I just wanna be cautious about like schedules change, but Right now, the intent is to get, um, like you said, a, a management track assessment in June of 2024, and then another one in 2025, just to get it back on the same cycle with um, Summer Fonder and SCUP, but just with the caution that schedules can change, but that's the intent, my understanding of the intent right now. Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Julia. Apologies that I don't know this off the top of my head. So. The recreational demand model right now running status quo measures predicts an 8.4 million pound harvest. And I recognize that there have been multiple improvements to the RDM over the past year, but can you remind me what the predicted harvest was for these same measures last year? How they differ? Julia, go ahead. I would have to look that up. Um, it should be in the same presentation from last year. It would just take me a second to find it. I can look at it as well. No, nope, no problem. I just didn't know if you had that readily available. Thanks. 
Emerson Hasbrook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Julia, for your presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is is a little bit similar um, to the question that was just asked. So, um, the recreational demand model is projecting an 8.4 million pound projected harvest uh, for 2024. Is, is that correct? Um, and if it is correct or whatever the number is, um, how much will that exceed the projected RHL for 2024? That's my first question. Um, that's right. It's predicting 8.4 million pounds. I'll just go back to that slide. And the RHL is 6.27 million pounds. So I haven't done that math for that percentage. Um, but gosh, that's like a 30 percent um, overage of the RHL. Thank you. Um, my next question has to do with with process. So, if, if I understand things, the percent change approach is going to sunset at the end of the 2025 fishing year. So, if if the 20 if the percent change approach sunsets at the end of the 2025 fishing year, and if we choose status quo for 2024. Then in 2024, we're going to have the new assessment available, which may precipitate changes in 2025. And then for 2026, we're going to be under um, some other variation, perhaps, of the harvest control rule, which will precipitate possibly changes again in 2026. So even if we go with status quo, we're going to be making changes probably in 2025 and 2026. So I'm not seeing where this really buys us a lot of st stability. So uh, am I correct in the timing on process there? Julia? Yes, and that was part of the monitoring committee's point was that because of those timing issues, it felt like this could be the only opportunity to have um, stability and measures have the same measures be unchanged across two years for black sea bass, because, like you said, due to the timing of the assessments, um, we could be changing measures in 2025 and then again in 2026. Thank you. John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just curious if I, I don't know if I missed it when you said what the. MRIP data was for this year from waves one through four. Uh, was there an estimate of the change in discards? Because I know, like in our region, we raised the size limit. I'm just curious if that's available yet. Um, that information is available through MRIP, but I didn't pull it or summarize it um, for any of the information provided today, but it, it could be found um, through the MRIP website. So I don't have a answer on that. Um, and while I have the mic, I did look back at the RDM results that were presented at the same meeting last year and that, I guess, sorry, I don't think I have like the exact right answer for this. That predicted, sorry, I looked up the wrong thing. Um, I would have to look up the harvest target that was for a later meeting at the board. But in any case, whatever it predicted, I don't think it's um, totally apples to apples because there were multiple changes in the model used, um, there was discussions of the years that go into the, um, the catch per trip assumptions. Um, there was an additional year of data added. Um, so I think we would expect the numbers to be different um, just because there were some changes um, in the model. Um, but sorry, I, I don't have the right number yet. I thought I did, but then as I started talking, I realized I looked up the wrong thing. Sorry about that. Michelle Duvall. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So, Julia, I was looking at your presentation from last year, and I thought because there was like the RFDM, and then we got the letter from the regional office that came in late recommending the RDM. And so, I think 
like the RFDM had predicted 11.96 million pounds, and then the RDM, I think that was 7.93, notwithstanding all of the changes that have occurred to that model. But I was just curious what the comparison was of, you know, what we knew at this time last year versus what we know now. Thanks. John. Thank you for the presentation, Julia. Um, and I, I'm not sure you can answer this question, but I'm just wondering, does the RDM benefit from multiple years of stable regulations when determining the following year's harvest? Thank you. Julia? Um, I'm not sure if any of the Science Center staff are available on the web webinar to provide a more specific answer on that, on that, but I would say maybe. I'm not, I don't feel like I can give a, a totally informed um, answer, but I think it's possible. Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this may be a question for um, commission staff, but um, would a, a status quo approach here allow for any um, minor tweaking of seasons through conservation equivalency? Um, in the past, there's been several states that have been interested to maintain, you know, make sure that Labor Day or Labor Day or Memorial Day is captured in their season and due to calendar changes, you know, that might change. So is there room in a status quo approach for um, CE proposals to make minor adjustments? Thanks. So the answer is possibly yes, but with some caveats of what the RDM might be able to do later. And I can let Tony cover anything I've missed, but um, it's something that we could basically go back to in January, look at with the states and see what we can do. Any more questions or comments? I agree. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just want to see if I have this straight in my own mind. So the, the RHL has been exceeded by 64% over the last three years. The AM has been triggered. GARFO was recommending status quo, and the RDM says we're going to go over the RHL by 35%. Is that, is that correct? Okay, Julian. Um, I'd say yes, approximately. I, don't, I didn't look up the specific percentages, but that is part of the um, the percent change approach is that it it doesn't um, have us trying to under the old process we were always trying to allow harvest to meet but not exceed the RHL and under the percent change approach it instead puts us in categories like instead of taking whatever the full reduction might be to get to the RHL you take a ten percent reduction for example in this situation um, so um, I think I think the answer is yes but that's just Part of what was approved through the percent change approach. Any more questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, before we tackle, or the board's going to tackle the Virginia black sea bass opening, let's uh, go ahead and see if we can get the 2024 recreational management measure for black sea bass. And I believe you have a draft motion ready. Would anybody like to make this motion on behalf of the council and the board? Joe, Chris for both council and Dan John Clark, Jacob second for both. Joe, would you like to go ahead and read this into the minutes, please? Sure, Mr. Chairman. Move to adopt conservation equivalency for 2024 rec recreational black sea bass management with status quo measures. Status quo non preferred coast wide measures are 15 inch minimum size, five fish possession limit, and May 15th through September 8th open season. Status quo precautionary default measures are 16 inch minimum size, two fish possession limit, 
and January 1st through August 31st open season. Thank you, Joe. Any discussion on the motion? Adam Nowalski. So with the percent change approach being relatively new, only been used for a couple of years, we've only had the benefit of seeing the performance of it under certain conditions, namely highly abundant stocks, at least up in black sea bass, lower abundance fluke. The high abundance has led to essentially the inability of anglers to get away from these higher available species. So we hear this argument about that we've got a projected harvest that exceeds an RHL. But we need to remember that the percent change approach also works in the other direction. So that when we have instances where the RDM will project a lower harvest than the RHL, we will not be taking those extreme liberalizations because of the constraining factors of the RDM of the percent change approach in the other direction as well. So I would hope that we can take a long-term approach to management here and understand that this works both ways and not just simply look at this in a one-year vacuum and recognize the approach that we're projecting and you to utilize here today is part of a longer-term process that will hopefully be beneficial to both the resource as well as the angling community. Thank you. Tony Kearns. Just a point of clarification, I don't think we need to do a separate motion for the Virginia fishery since we don't know yet if Virginia plans on using the February fishery. I think that this motion tells us or we can um, assume that Virginia will use option one that Tracy presented if they don't do the February fishery. And if they do do their February fishery status quo would just be the process that they used in 2023 where they are open February 1 through February 29th and then they adjust their season and we do a, um, a board vote via email to adjust their season once they have those February fishery landings. So I don't think you need an extra one if that is the pleasure of the board it makes it a little easier. All right, thank you, Tony. Any more comments around the table? John? Just to um, reiterate my support for the monitoring committee's recommendations. I think, you know, the percent change approach was about uh, providing the fishery with stability. And I also can't help but think that the model itself will also benefit um, being able to kind of capture the uncertainty around the given set of measures and how that impacts harvest. Um, and I'd also like to proceed um, in the future from a, from an assessment instead of a assessment data that you know was last updated as of 2019. Thank you. Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to quickly note my support for the motion. Um, you know, we find ourselves in a situation that wasn't contemplated by the management action that put this management framework in place. Uh, we don't have updated stock assessment information informing the current RHL. And I, I think in that instance, we have to fall back on what was the intent of, of the percent change approach. And I think one of the major intents of that action was to, you know, get off the hamster wheel of changing measures every year for these species and chasing the RHL. Um, if, you know, we were to change measures this year, that would be a third year in a row and we'd be setting ourselves up for a situation as, you know, we heard earlier today with the stock assessment schedule, we'd potentially be changing measures every year from 2022 through 2026. So I think that would just, you know, it runs completely counter to the intent of the percent change approach. Uh, the only reason we're, you know, would even have a conversation about changing measures this year, as was earlier stated, is because we didn't have the 2024 RHL available when we were setting 2023 measures. That 2024 RHL would have had to have been drastically different than the 2023 RHL to produce a different outcome uh, than setting measures in 2023 and, and leaving them in place. Uh, so I, I just think, uh, you know, when I think about the intent of the percent change approach, it seems like clearly the, uh, the appropriate action for this coming year is status quo. Emerson Hasbrook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to oppose this motion, but I have several concerns 
um, that I want to, uh, and I want to voice my concerns and put them on the record. Um, one is that, you know, we've just heard that we've exceeded the RHL by an average of 64% over the past, I don't remember how many years, past five or six years. Um, and that uh, with the RDM, we're projected to exceed the RHL in 2024 by 30%. Also, the monitoring committee was not sure what the impact will be in the future if we go with status quo in 2024. Um, so we may be putting ourselves in a situation where in 2024 for 2025, we may have to take an even more significant reduction in the recreational fishery and biomass is still likely to be at a fairly high level. So that's going to be a tough sell at that point in time if we, if we get there and we might, we might get there. The other thing that I'm concerned about. Um, and this goes back to June of 2022 when both of our, when both the, the council and the commission approved the use of the percent change approach. Um, and the document provided, the document and the presentation provided by the SSC about harvest control rule said that if constraining one sector is more challenging and leads to larger deviations from the specified catch targets, the patterns of allocation may be substantially different to those specified in the policy. This can lead to effective, quote, borrowing, unquote, of quota from the more controlled sector and thus to increase levels of contention in the fishery management process. Now, we don't have further information about the borrowing issue at this time, but we've charged the SSC in their uh, review and recommendations for future um, actions um, with the harvest control rule to provide us with information on this effect of borrowing. So, my concern is still that we're just going to keep this borrowing process going on. So those are my concerns. I don't know if anybody else has any similar concerns. Thank you. Captain Victor. After I'm done, there's somebody online with their hand raised. Please take him. Now, since two, you know, all our people see are better regs, and I can't believe that people at the table aren't opposed to a lot of this. I just see people following suit. But in 2019, they said we were 210%. We have went over every single year. We've never gotten a break on this fishery. Right now, there's an 80% confidence in this fishery that it should be between seven. 0.772 and 9.8 pounds. You already set us up to fail in 2024 by making a 6.27 million pound RHL. So we're going to go over. You're sitting here saying that we're going to go over. Instead of raising it somewhere up around the 9 million pound mark so that we can't go over. If this fishery was in trouble, we wouldn't be able to catch them. We wouldn't keep going over. That's just common sense. It really is. If people would have seen better regs in 2019 when you knew this fishery was at 2,000 or 210 percent, we people wouldn't even be arguing now. But all they see are cut after cut after cut. We're getting blamed for dead discards, especially. I can't even believe New York isn't backing their own fishermen because they got more dead discards than New Jersey. I mean, lower your limits so that we don't have, get blamed for dead discards. 
We can't keep going down a path or waiting for a track to come. Let me tell you something. If I was walking in here and nobody, none of the advisors were saying we were catching them, yeah, then you know what? We might have to look at taking a cut. But there's not a boat out there that's not catching them. And this is really hard to get, not get emotional about. When since 2019, we've been getting the suckiest regulations, especially in New Jersey, who wants to go out and catch one fish on a party boat that you're paying me $100 and two flounder? So every day my customers go out and we, we may be able to catch four fish, maybe, if we're lucky. I don't even go near where I know the sea bass are because I'm going to get blamed for killing them. I'm going to keep one, but I'm going to catch 20 or 30. I can't believe that you guys all follow suit with it. The motions will probably go 11 to whatever, and nobody, I'm New York and New Jersey should be side by side in fighting this battle for their recreational fishermen and the poor science that they have to keep track of what they're catching. And now like the man says, oh, well, next year we might have to pay back the 20%. Well, what if you come back on the research track next year and we're at 250%? Are we gonna get 15 fish for the whole year? You better start thinking about it because you're doing something wrong. And it seems like the man in the corner, Mr. Petney, has the ultimate say whether, well, we don't really need to take a cut this year. I don't even understand that. If he's got the ultimate say, then what, what are the rest of you guys doing here? I, I mean, if we weren't catching him, it'd be one thing. But this fish is all over the place. So they're not in any danger like scuff. Scup isn't in any danger neither. You guys just can't see it. And please take Howard because he's raised his hand yesterday and you didn't answer. There are people that care. Howard, I apologize. I did not see your hand raised yesterday at the time. Uh, Howard, go ahead. Yeah, it's Howard Bogan. Um, you know, for years we were going to these meetings telling the council how plentiful sea bass were. And nobody really believed this until 2019 when then all of a sudden they discovered they were 210% rebuilt. Um, status quo is the least we should get right now. It should be liberalized. liberalized. But I do have one question though, the way this is written right now, does this mean the states will be able to go with the same regulations they had in 2023 for 2024? Is this non-preferred coastwide measures any different than it was last year? Julia or Tracy? Yes, it'll be the same measures. Um, the non-preferred measures there will be waived for what um, states had in 2023. All right, thank you. I mean, it, this, this should be the least we get. It really should be liberalized, but I know that's not going to happen. And I didn't even comment on the scup because I figured the state of New Jersey wasn't going to be able to move quick enough to open it this year anyway. But at least you improved the winter opening for scup, which never should have been closed in the first place. Thank you. Hey, Wilkie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Kate Wilkie with the Nature Conservancy. Um, again. Uh, the council and board is sitting around the table and making the decision to stay status quo and and knowingly exceed the RHL based on the predict predictions. Um, I'm not hearing a lot of concern vocalized around the table um, because there is a list of justifications or excuses, which honestly are, are logical. Um, but but what happens when the harvest then exceeds limits over and over and I'm, I'm thinking about it and and the two things that i that come into my mind are either there will be ramifications on the stock or the stock assessment and the subsequent calculations to establish the catch limits uh it should have been higher and so like we're not getting the math right or something and and so then in that case exceeding the limits wouldn't have detrimental effects. Um, either of those situations are concerning to me. Um, and so I just encourage the council and the board to take a step back and look at the broader picture 
see if there are steps beyond this harvest control rule or, or this measure, this new measure setting process that can help address the circular problems. Thanks. Mike Pernock. Uh, good morning and thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Pierdnock, uh, president of the Stellwagen Bank Charter Boat Association, which consists of, of the four hire fleet and recreational anglers that fish at Massachusetts state waters. My comments today are on behalf of the Stellwagen Bank Charter Boat Association. And uh, it's really more of the same of what you've already heard. The, the black sea bass that we see in our waters is just uh, such that it's in inconsistent with the fact that there should be any cuts or reductions um you know with the changing stock distribution we have a tremendous biomass that's in our waters here in massachusetts and to hear that there's any additional cuts where we're already faced with the seizing from may uh roughly may 18th or 21st to the beginning of september with a closure and a force fish limit it's getting to the point that if we have to have additional cuts with such a biomass it, it will lose all credibility with fishery management with such an inconsistency so I, I, I ask that that to be taken into consideration and that there, there needs to be something done because the timing of these surveys is not uh, capturing uh, the biomass that's out, out there as a result of that changing stock distribution. Thank you. Mike Wayne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike Wayne with the American Sport Fishing Association. Speaking in support of this motion, I was hearing some of the comments made about exceeding the RHL. <clears throat> and I, I was asking Julia if she could pull up the fishing mortality estimates, <clears throat> excuse me, that were realized um in those years in which the uh, rhl was exceeded and so from memory um even though remember the the way acl management works is it's based on a projection analysis and then when the subsequent stock assessment occurs we get estimates of fishing mortality that are associated with those levels of catch so can you show it on the screen? I don't need to see it. Can you show it? On? If Stephen can pull up my presentation again, I don't know if this is appropriate to switch so, to the presentation, but the new last slide in the presentation. Anyways, the point being um, the realized fishing mortality in the years in which the RHLs were exceeded show that overfishing was not occurring. And so there's clearly this disconnect, which I've talked about over and over at the mic, in which the projected the projections in the ACLs that we use do not define overfishing. Realized fishing mortality in those years is what defines overfishing. And the disconnect is such that when there, there's just a mismatch in which the catch is exceeding the RHL with the stock assessment is conducted and we see in those years, fishing mortality is below the FMSY target, meaning overfishing was not occurring. Furthermore, some of the most egregious overages are associated with some of the lowest fishing mortality estimates in the time series. So something is not right here, but I just wanted to clarify for the record that it's about realized fishing mortality. That's how our fishing is defined. Thanks. Tom Fody, did I see your hand up? Tom Fody, Jersey Coast Angle Association, New Jersey State Federation of Sportsman Clubs. I guess I always sound like a broken record. When uh, when Pew, NRDC, a lot of us supported change the Magnus Stevens Act in 2006 and wound up being passed in 2007, 
Congress told us that we need to get a better information on recreational fishing. John Borman, Dr. John Borman was put in charge of that from NIMS. He testified before Congress that in order to do this job properly, we need about $50 million. Well, let's see. In, 19, in the eight, 1980s, we were spending $18 million to gather the recreational statistics. We are now here 2023, and we're still spending the same $18 million. I hope that the environmental groups like Pew and RGC Ocean Conservancy will go with us to Congress to appropriate the funds needed to NIPS to do their job properly. It's not their fault they can't get the right information. We didn't give them the money to do that. What we're doing is tweaking models, tweaking models to basically handle bad data. We need to get you the proper data. We also need to get the stock assessment again, which really shows what the stocks are, not the guesstimates that we get. And we all know that. So it's really, I, I you know I yell at NIMS all the time, but it's not NIMS fault, it's not the scientists at the Northeast. It's the problem is that we haven't appropriated the money. Congress has not appropriated the money. The president hasn't appropriated money, but they gave you the task of doing the job without the money. And they're, thought, they're famous for doing that. So thank you for the time. Bye. No more hands around the table or the audience are online. I'm going to go ahead and call the motion to a vote. This will be council only first again. So, all those in favor, please vote on the computer with your hand up, please. Okay. Run a note. Peter Hughes has his hand up and he got booted offline. We have 19 in favor. Please lower your hands. Are there any null votes? Seeing none, any abstentions? Seeing none, the motion passes 19 0 to 0. Oh, one abstention, I'm sorry. Did not see that. Nicola? Does the board need any time to caucus? Please raise your hand if you do. Seeing none, is there any objection to this motion from the board? Please raise your hand. All right, we'll do a vote. I see one hand at least, so we'll do a vote. Um, hands down. All those in favor, please raise your hand online. New Jersey, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Virginia, Delaware, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, and Maryland. 10 votes in favor. Please lower your hands. One more. Yeah, there we go. All right. Uh, those opposed to the motion, please raise your hand. Rhode Island. One up, one in, uh, in opposition. Any um, abstentions? No fisheries. Please lower, lower your hands. And any null votes? Seeing none, the motion carries. Ten, one to one. Ten in favor, one opposed, one abstention. Thank you. And since with status quo measures, it looks like the board doesn't have to have a motion for February fishery. Tracy, Julia, is there anything else to bring before us? Tony Kern? As um, uh, we noted before, if there is a state that does want to tweak their measures, if they can reach out to us so we know that, um, and then we'll talk to Lou, see if it's possible, if it is, 
we'll work with those states to do so. Do you have a question about that, Joe? Yeah, we could do that. I, I mean, I was just curious, like, I don't know, like not knowing the RDM that well, but I think when it, if it's modeling angular behavior, that would be around the holidays and dates, not the, you know what I mean? It, angular behavior is based on those those days that we're trying to open because they're they're weekends, not whatever that calendar date was. I would think the accuracy would would be there based on uh, us moving those. All right, so we'll we'll move forward with the approach that states can propose conservation equivalency changes, but provided that RDM can model that. I don't see why it wouldn't be able to, but. I think that we may have to put some bounds on it, and I don't know what those are, and so I'm trying to figure that out without having talked to Lou. I don't want to make a promise that it can happen, um, and so. We just need to make sure that we have a, a, a path forward to do it that um, can work. And that, that path forward would include board approval of any changes at the mid-February meeting along with SCUP and, and, and Luke measures. So, correct. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, with that, that's going to conclude the joint meeting between the uh, Council and the Atlantic State Marine Fisheries, Summer Flounder, SCUP, Sea Bass Board. Uh, we're now going to, before we start with our next agenda item, I think we're going to take a 13 minute break. We'll come back at 1030 and then we're going to have a joint meeting with the Atlantic State Marine Fishery Policy Board. So we'll see you back in a little bit.
All right, everybody, everybody, please take a seat. One minute warning. Joey, Tracy, and Chelsea, you guys ready? All right. Welcome back, everyone. Let's go on to our next agenda item. Uh, the Council and the Policy Board will review progress and discuss next steps on the summer flounder, scut black sea bass, and bluefish recreational measures, setting process, framework, and addendum. Whenever you guys are ready. Great, thank you. And good morning, everyone, again. Um, we are going to be going through and giving you some updates um, on the recreational measure setting process framework and addenda today. So I will start off reviewing um, what we'll be discussing today. Um, today, Julia, Chelsea, and I will be giving you a brief overview to remind. Um, first, to remind you all about the alternatives under consideration in this management action. Um, Dex will provide a progress update on the management action, including um, work that the FMAP PDT has been doing, um, the MSE modeling group, um, the commissioner council and member work group, and some newly formed subgroups of the FMAP PDT. Um, we will then review next steps for this management action, and then you'll all have an item for your consideration today that will refine the range of preliminary alternatives based on a recommendation by the FMAP PDT. So, starting off with those alternatives under consideration, um, this slide shows the three alternatives currently under consideration in the addenda. Um, first, as you guys all know and love, the percent change approach um, that was approved under the harvest control rule um, framework addenda and has been used for the recreational measure setting process so far. Um, the next two alternatives under consideration for this management action are the biomass based matrix approach and the biological reference point approach, um, which you might recognize, um, which were all both alternatives. In the harvest control rule framework addenda and um, were referred to as the bind approaches. Um, this is because both use several pieces of information um, to determine which. Then a stock falls into and um, which ultimately guides the selection of management measures. So, the 1st, 1 I'll discuss um, is the biomass based matrix approach, which you can see way at the bottom of the slide. Um, is the simpler of the 2 um, using information of biomass compared to the target level and um, biomass trend. Which is. Whether biomass is increasing, stable, or decreasing to determine which bin a stock falls into. And so if a bin falls into bin, if a stock falls into bins closer to the top of the table, um, you'll, the stock will be assigned more liberal, me liberal measures. And if a stock falls into a bin near the bottom, where you can see the orange and the red, um, it'll be assigned more restrictive measures. And then the other, um, the bio. Biological reference point approach, which is at the top right of the slide, um, is a little more complex. Uh, uses, it uses information of biomass compared to a target level and whether or not a stock is overfishing, um, if overfishing is occurring, to determine which bin a species falls into. And similarly, um, if a bin, if a stock falls into bins near the top, like the green, you, you assign more liberal measures and then all the way at the bottom, the yellow, the red is more restrictive measures. Um, so when measures are later reevaluated in the next year, if a species still falls into that bin, then we would 
look at new information, pieces of information like biomass trend, recruitment trend, and whether or not the RHL was exceeded to further refine measures. Um, the FMAT PDT is reviewing all of these alternatives to further develop them um, based on guidance by the Council and Commission. So in the next two slides, I was going to give a brief overview of a number of other items the FMAP PDT is considering as they work to develop the alternatives I just discussed, um, all a part of this management action. So the first two items for consideration here were approved by the Board and Council to be considered in this management action. The first is looking into incorporating a metric using fishing mortality rate um, into the percent change approach. This could be an alternative to the comparison of the RHL and confidence interval of estimated harvest that's currently part of the percent change approach. Um, the FMAP PDT will also be considering how an F-based approach may fit into the other alternatives. Um, the FMAP PDT is also reevaluating the percentages of liberalization or reduction, like that 10, 20, and 40 percent in the percent change approach to determine what are the to determine what are the most appropriate numbers there. Um, in addition, uh, particularly dependent on today's de decision point for the board and council related to this management action, the FMAP PDT will be looking into um, how to modify the biological reference point and biomass-based matrix approaches to no longer include the predetermined measures. So, in addition, this is just continuing some other considerations that the um, FMAP PDT is looking into as we develop the, these alternatives. Um, the FMAP PDT will be re-examining the target metrics for setting measures appropriate for the stock conditions represented by a BIM. Um, so, this could be a target level of harvest, dead catch, or fishing mortality. Um, all of this you might recognize um, that was in the original harvest control rule framework agenda. So, the FMAP PDT will be re-examining this issue. Um, other considerations the FMAP PDT will be looking into um, are how to determine an appropriate starting point for all the state's measures and uh, potentially developing example measures for the alternatives. In addition, um, the FMAP PDT will be considering how the alternatives interact with management uncertainty buffers. And the FMAP PDT has also been directed by the board and council to con further consider the issue of borrowing from the commercial sector as identified by the SSC. Um, this issue relates to potential impacts the recreational management measures could have on the uh, commercial sector and is not intended to mean quota will be taken from the commercial sector and given to the recreational sector. Instead, it's meant to address challenges related to um, the differences and how well constrained the commercial and recreational sectors are to their allocated limits. And um, I think Julia will go into a discussion of the AP had on the issue of borrowing um, from the commercial sector later in this presentation. And then lastly, um, the FMAP PDT um, will consider how the current accountability measures and conservation equivalency fit into or interact with this management action. And I will now hand over the presentation to Chelsea. All right, uh, so up on the screen here are just very brief summaries of the two meetings that the FMAT and PDT has held since the Council and Policy Board last met in August. So at the first meeting, the group discussed fishery and stock status indicators, associated thresholds, and management responses associated with all of the alternatives, particularly in how those things would relate to the summer flounder management strategy evaluation or MSE model that the FMAT and PDT is using. Additionally, the FMAT and PDT has formed two subgroups to focus on the 10, 20, and 40% liberalization or reduction values in the percent change approach. So one subgroup will be further evaluating those. And the other subgroup will be focusing on F-based approaches for the percent change approach and the other alternatives being considered based on previous guidance from the Council and Policy Board. Uh, the second FMAP and PDT meeting that has happened since August was joint with the newly formed Commissioner and Council Member Workgroup. And during this meeting, the, groups, the two groups started preliminary discussions on, again, on F-based approaches the potential for including predetermined measures in the alternatives. And they also spoke a little bit about management uncertainty. And I'm going to go into more detail on some of these topics in a moment. 
So as a reminder for everyone, the Summer Ponder Management Strategy Evaluation Model, or MSE, is being utilized by the FMAT and PDT to test all three of the alternatives under consideration. Uh, the MSE is a couple model, coupled modeling approach that incorporates stock dynamics, regulations, and angler behavior. And the MSE modelers have been meeting with the FMAT and PDT, and they've began preparing the model per the FMAT and PDT's direction. The initial focus on testing is to test the thresholds that define the boundaries between bins under each alternative. And the MSE will allow the FMAT and PDT to compare how each approach performs under a range of different conditions. And it'll allow the FMAT and PDT to suggest potentially eliminating alternatives that are not performing well when they're tested. The goal is to use the results of the MSE to help inform the Council and Policy Board in next August, so August of 2024, on the range of alternatives for public hearings. And just as a timeline, the FMAT and PDT plans to assess the results of the MSE and add any last minute analysis in May of this year. So to touch briefly on some preliminary discussions about F-based approaches um, and the topics that the F-based approaches FMAT PDT subgroup will discuss, uh, first, F-based approaches are being considered, as Tracy mentioned, as a potential alternative to that RHL versus confidence interval threshold in the percent change approach. And that F would be the recreational fishing mortality rate expected to result from status quo measures. And it would be compared to a recreational F threshold. The FMAT and PDT will also discuss the merits of considering fishing mortality under other approaches being considered in the action in addition to the percent change approach. So to go a little bit more into detail, the F-based approaches subgroup and larger FMAT and PDT will give further consideration into how to define a recreational fishing mortality rate and the potential for defining a recreational fishing mortality threshold. So management does not currently use or assign fishing mortality rates or fishing mortality targets to the recreational sector. Uh, one example that was proposed during the development of the harvest control rule was to calculate the F associated with the recreational ACL by applying the recreational allocation percentage to the F rate associated with the ABC. So that will be further explored. Um, but it should be noted that our currently available analysis tools like the RDM are not configured to predict F in upcoming years based on specified measures. So again, these discussions are very preliminary right now, but in early in the new year, the subgroup will begin to meet and they will bring their discussions to the larger FMAT and PDT um, to make some more decisions on. And Julia is going to cover the remainder of the presentation here. Um, so next, I'm going to get into a little bit more detail on the predetermined measures concept, because this is something we'd like the council and policy board to think about today in terms of a specific recommendation from the FMAT and PDT. Um, so to remind you what this means, this is a concept that's incorporated into the biological reference point and biomass based matrix approaches as initially envisioned. And I just put the. Um, the visuals on the screen here, just to remind you of what those alternatives are. These are the ones with all the various bins. And the original intent behind these alternatives was that measures would be assigned to all bins through the specifications process the first time the approach is used. So the bin associated with the, the best metrics um, would have the most liberal measures, and then it would get progressively more restrictive. Um, but again, the intent was that the first time the approach is used, measures will be assigned to all bins. You can see under one of the approaches, there's seven bins, and within most of those bins, there's default and secondary measures. So that adds up to 13 sets of measures. And then for the other one, there's six bins, so six sets of measures. And then that's not considering if there was a desire to have different measures for different regions associated with those sets of measures. So there would be a lot of um, different measures that would be would need to be assigned. Um, so during the previous action, the previous FMET and PDT talked about um, 
modified versions of these alternatives where there's not predefined measures, that measures are not assigned to all the bins all at once, but rather the bins would still function the same way. It's just that if you move from one bin to another, that means you need to change your measures and that measures would still need to achieve an appropriate target that's associated with that bin. So this concept came up towards the end of the previous management action and the council and policy board did previously agree to further develop this concept, but it wasn't fully developed through the previous management action because it came up towards the end. So it wasn't um, part of the range of alternatives that was previously considered, but these modified versions, um, the council and policy board has already agreed to consider this as an additional alternative. Um, and then the FMAT and PDT talked more about if there are these predetermined measures, if measures are assigned to all of the bins the first time it's used through the specifications process, what would that entail? And then they also talked about um, the management strategy evaluation analysis that is planned to analyze all of these alternatives and how could we go about using that to analyze um, an approach where there's measures assigned to all of the bins. And they agreed that it would be pretty complicated to come up with something that would look like example predetermined measures and that instead for the sake of analysis, it might make more sense to just um, pick a target level of harvest or catch for each bin and have there be certain percentage changes between the bins. They felt like that would be more simple and more straightforward just for the sake of analysis that we're planning to do to help compare across alternatives. Um, and then kind of more generally, the FMAT and PDT had concerns with the feasibility of assigning measures to all of the bins um, all at once, including the bins that are associated with fishery and stock conditions that are very different from the current conditions. So um, it might you know, be more straightforward to think about bins that are similar to current conditions, what measures might be most appropriate. But with the information available to us right now, it, we would have to make a lot of assumptions about what measures would be appropriate for very different conditions. And by the time we get to the different conditions, we might have new information and the previously assigned measures might not be appropriate any longer. So they kind of questioned if it was worthwhile to assign measures to all of the bins for that reason too. And then they also just had general concern with the amount of analysis that would be needed to develop measures for all bins. So like I said, there's there would be 13 sets of measures under one alternative and six under the other, and then multiplied even more thinking about um, state and regional measures associated with, with each set for each species. That would just be a tremendous amount of analysis. And the FMAT and PDT questioned if it would really be worth um, doing that. So the FMAT and PDT's recommendation is to remove the predetermined measures concept from the range of preliminary alternatives. And that would mean that um, the biological reference point approach and the biomass based matrix approach, they would still stay within the range of preliminary alternatives. We would just only focus on them as um, the bins kind of telling you when you need to change measures um, and that it wouldn't include the concept of assigning measures to all the bins the first time it's used through the specifications process. Um, it would just focus on the version where um, the bins just tell you when you need to change measures. And the FMAT and PDT will have further discussion of when you need to change measures, what is the target that you're aiming for? Is it based in harvest or catch or something else? And how is it defined to help differentiate across the bins, but that we wouldn't go through the effort of assigning measures to every bin all at once. Um, so we had um, an AP meeting last Monday um, that focused on rec measures in the upcoming years, but we briefly gave them an update on this management action. And we do plan to have more in-depth discussions with the AP in the future once we get further along in the analysis and development of the alternatives. But last week, we just kind of wanted to remind them that this action is happening and there are these ongoing efforts to try to improve the process for setting recreational measures for these species. So I'll just briefly summarize some things that the AP had to say. Um, one advisor said um, that he supported using trend data in the alternatives as an indicator to help tell um, if and how you need to change measures. So for example, this could include trends in biomass and or recruitment. This advisor said that um, thinking about trends can help us think about what's coming in the future, um, where things are going, as opposed to just how things look right now. Um, I think it was the same advisor also recommended incorporating a metric of recreational catch per unit effort into the alternatives. 
to help think about what's going on in the fishery. Um, there was concern expressed about the use of MRIP data under these alternatives, given issues with the fishing effort survey, which I think we're all pretty familiar with by now. And um, one advisor expressed hope that this action will improve management. So you heard lots of comments today and yesterday about frustration um, that that measures can't be more liberal right now for scuff and black sea bass, given that biomass is so high. Um, so one advisor said that you know hopefully this management action would be a way to help um, address issues like that. There also was a discussion about the issue of borrowing. Um, so this has been discussed a few times already today. Um, so it, it was on the list of other considerations, this issue raised by the SSC um, that was phrased as borrowing from the commercial sector. And like Chelsea said, this was intended to be more about thinking about um, what are the impacts of how we set recreational management and how well constrained the recreational fishery is compared to the commercial fishery to their respective limits um, to think about the implications uh, for the commercial sector on this of this action that's focused on the recreational sector. So some advisors um, heard the word borrowing and they wanted to make it very clear that they are strongly opposed to allowing the recreational sector to borrow quota from the commercial sector. Um, staff tried to clarify that transferring quotas between sectors is not something that's under consideration through this action, that um, the, the borrowing issue was more meant to address general implications to the commercial sector, um, but just the, the, the phrasing of the language used um, kind of uh, generated this conversation that some advisors just wanted to make it very clear that they didn't want anything to be taken from the commercial sector and given to the recreational sector. Um, some specific um, points that some advisors raised related to that um, were due to things like concerns about the differences in the reporting requirements for the commercial versus recreational sectors. Um, so there was comments along the lines of the commercial has a lot more and more accurate reporting than the recreational sector. And one advisor said that um, borrowing condones RHL overages. Um, and then the last um, slide here is just a timeline of next steps. And wanted to emphasize that we're working towards a goal of August 2024 meeting for the council and policy board to approve a final range of alternatives and a draft document for public hearings. And um, we have a lot of work to do that we're planning for between now and then. Um, from early next year through next summer, the FMAT and PDT is going to do a lot of work to continue to develop and analyze the alternatives. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot more meetings um, that we you know, don't have spelled out here, but we are thinking about how the SSC will get involved. Um, so stay tuned. There'll be a lot more work done over the next several months. Again, aiming for that August 2024 date to have a final range of alternatives and a draft document for public hearings. Then public hearings can take place in the fall of next year and then have some follow on meetings to think about what we heard in public hearings, develop recommendations for final action with the goal of taking final action in April of 2025 to allow enough time for um, developing the document um, or the associated documents and the rulemaking process so that a new um, whatever the final action decision is that that can be um, implemented in time to use when setting 2026 measures, because as was previously stated today, um, the percent change approach sunsets at the end of 2025 with the goal of using a new process for 2026 measures. So we built this timeline around that. Um, that's all we had. We're happy to take questions and just a reminder that the decision point is we're asking the Council and Policy Board to consider the FMAT and PDT's recommendation to remove the predetermined measures concept from the range of preliminary, preliminary, preliminary alternatives just to help us moving forward focus our attention on um, uh, the, a refined range of alternatives to further develop. Thank you. Questions or comments for Julia, Tracy, or Chelsea? John? I thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was involved with the uh, early development of the biological reference point. Approach that always frustrated me that this body, the public, and then later the SSC review got so hung up on the need for predetermined measures that they really weren't willing to consider the merits of either the, the matrix or the biological reference point approach as kind of a framework for decision making. So I think this um, uh, modification that the uh, PDT FMAT is making is a good one, and I support it. Thank you.
Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, um, Julia, for the, the review. And so one of my questions was sort of partially addressed, and that was the role of the SSC. And I hadn't seen anything in the timeline for um, SSC involvement moving forward. So I'm glad to hear that you all are thinking about that. Um, and I, I definitely think it's necessary. Some of these approaches are very technical, and I think, you know, especially thinking about how to best integrate an F based approach, I think it's really going to be um, beneficial to have SSC members involved in that. So, you know, I would expect maybe that might occur at their spring meeting or something, something like that to provide some feedback. And then just with respect to the, um, the predetermined measures. And so just to confirm, we would still have, we're still going to have all the bins, but we would just wait until something is triggered before we would develop measures for a particular bin. I'm seeing nods. Okay. And I guess, um, you know, it's sort of a balance between, you know, a crushing amount of analysis that would be required to, you know, have measures associated with all these bins. We certainly understand that. And, um, you know, again, similar to what John said, I agree that sometimes, you know, we don't want folks to get too hung up on what the measures are because, you know, they could change depending on circumstances. I guess my only concern is how long it might take to develop those measures once we hit a certain bin to sh make sure that we're on, we're not delaying action that needs to be taken when it needs to be taken. Thanks. Shanna Matson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you all hear me okay? I didn't check my audio and I was having some trouble. Yes, you sound fine. Okay, great. Um, so I kind of want to uh, echo what both John and Dr. Duval uh, brought up regarding this recommendation to remove predetermined measures. Um, the question that I had, and and maybe it's and maybe it's a statement. I have a couple of questions actually. Um, my first question is. By using the percent adjustments, so I see that there's two recommendations that the FMAT and PDT will consider how the measure should change when we move from bin to bin, whether or not that's like a percent change, which is essentially what we're doing in the percent change approach, or basing it on another target, um, like an F-based approach. Um, I'm just kind of wondering if we end up considering percent adjustments as that way to move from bin to bin, it, doesn't this sort of just become another percent change approach, but the other two um, harvest control rules have uh, more parameters incorporated as to what we consider when we're moving from bin to bin. So that's my question number one. Um, yes, Shanna, um, we'd be considering, you know, a bunch of different things outside of what's in the percent change approach for the other alternatives. Um, if there's a percent change from bin to bin. Okay, but wouldn't it pretty much be the same? Just, I guess, maybe fancier. <laughs> they haven't discussed this yet. Yeah. And I mean, essentially not. I wouldn't say fancier, but that they'd be considering, you know, outside of a comparison of RHL to um, an estimated thing of, you know, estimate ugh, estimation of harvest. Um, but things like biomass trend, other things from the stock assessment would be taken into consideration. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so, like per per that follow up, it kind of confirms what I was thinking. Um, I think I'm really interested in seeing how these two approaches end up working with an F-based approach versus another percent change approach. I agree. Um, obviously, we're looking at a lot more parameters with these other two harvest control rules. However, um, this movement of just a certain percentage without having necessarily a target to aim for, I think might be causing some of the problems that we're seeing right now using the percent change approach. So my um, recommendation would be to strongly look into trying to utilize these two approaches 
um, based on looking at a target, whether that be F or something else that the group and the SSC decide. Um, and I have one follow up question, uh, Mr. Chair. Apologies, I know that I'm bogarting the time here. <laughs> Go ahead and ask it. All right, great. Um, so the other quick question I had was, um, in order to kind of get to this recommendation, has the PDT and FMAP, have they looked into cons using historic management measures and their associated responses, maybe to try to help you set a starting point for how those bins move? Julia. We were just discussing amongst ourselves how to most uh, appropriately answer this. Um, I'd say we, um, we, the FMAT and PDT um, didn't really discuss it in great detail, but there was kind of a separately broader consideration of what's the most appropriate starting point for measures. Um, there was some analysis in the past that kind of fed into the percent change approach about what things were in the past and changes that were made. Um, so there, I think there will be some consideration of past um, management measures, but I don't think that it necessarily like alleviates the concern about the huge um, amount of analysis that would be needed for the um, predetermined measures concept. Great, thanks, Julia. Um, I appreciate that, and um, I just want to state that I. Um, and fine with the FMAT and PDT recommendations um, per your responses. Thank you, guys. Mike Pentney. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, thanks for the update and uh, agree with the other speakers and, and agree with that, the concept of removing the, the predetermined measures from the, from the alternatives. I think uh, you know, over the last couple of years, we've learned a lot and we've got some experience now under our belts with using the percent change approach, um, particularly in light of the recreational demand model that we have now compared to what we thought we would have when we were developing the initial framework adjustment. So I think, you know, utilizing what we've learned through through the, the experience of the last couple of years and understanding how we can best apply the recreational demand model as it exists now and how, how, it, how it may evolve into the future, I think, would help us refine these alternatives without the need for predetermined measures. Um, you know, I think recognizing that the med, the alternatives probably do need to be refined. I think uh, just saying bin one, bin two doesn't isn't very informative to anybody. Um, but you know, refining that to say where we would liberalize, where we would be able to maintain status quo, and and how much would we liberalize or or, or be more restrictive under certain uh, biological conditions? I think would be helpful. Uh, and, and that seems in line with what the recreational demand model can support. So uh, support the, the monitoring committee's uh, FMAT's recommendation and, and hope we can move forward and get creative and innovate in terms of how, we, uh, how we're managing the recreational fisheries. Thanks. David Borden. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, just a Kind of a simple question. I have not followed all the deliberations of the subcommittees, uh, so this question may have already been uh, addressed. Did the, so the question is, do any of the different uh, alternatives factor in consideration of the catch or lack of catch uh, in the other sector? Uh, and I can give you uh, a really simple example so that uh, everyone understands. If the recreational harvest is a million pounds over and the commercial harvest is a million pounds under, is there a, anything built into any of these alternatives that allows a reconciliation process where the final decision becomes, uh, instead of mandatory, becomes optional? Hi, David. Thank you for your question. Um, so this action is that goes along with the lines of the borrowing concept that Julia and Tracy have discussed earlier in the presentation. And this action is considering you know, that kind of interaction between the commercial and recreational sector. Um, we're just 
considering trends that are things outside, excuse me, things outside of strictly the RHL and trends in stock assessments that could help inform recreational management. Yeah, I'd just make a quick point, Mr. Chairman, that that um, that that type of flexibility in my own own mind would be highly desirable, because we found ourselves in exactly that that position where we agonize over these decisions uh, and feel somewhat forced to take action. Uh, so a little bit of flexibility in the language might help. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, I, I can support the idea of removing the predetermined measures. Uh, I sort of felt all along like it, it was going to be really difficult to define some universe of predetermined measures that we think would be the appropriate response in like every situation we might find ourselves in in the future with these stocks. I am a little concerned, you know, and this feels a little bit off of what Shanna was talking about. If we now move to a situation where all the alternatives available to us are based on the idea of just making a relative change every time we change from where we're at. Uh, and that gets back to the, you know, something I've, I've continually think about this, with this is like the starting point problem with at least two of these species, scup and sea bass, we've been sort of steadily marching towards this place of getting more and more restrictive with recreational regulations, despite persistently high biomass despite any evidence that we're overfishing the stock. And so I've been concerned all along that you know, when we move to implement the next version of this, we'll be in some place that's so restrictive with recreational regulations that the possibility of getting back to something that approximates reasonable access on the recreational side will be really difficult if we're just sort of in a situation where all we can do is make a 10% change or a 15% change where we're at. I was sort of hoping that we were going to get to a place where there would be an idea of like some sort of regulatory reset on the recreational side. And I think that's less likely if we don't have predetermined measures. Um, that being said, if it's not tractable to develop those predetermined measures, that, that's fine. And I can understand that, but just want to keep that in mind as we move forward with this, that starting point problem of we can design a a really great system for doing this, but if we start off at some point where we are so restrictive on the recreational side, we're probably never going to get out of that box. Julie, you have a motion that can go up on the board or Stephen does? Anybody like to make this motion on behalf of the board and the council? Adam Nowalski is for the board and the council. We have a second. John Clark for the board and the council. Adam, I'd like to read the motion into the minutes, please. Sure, I'll go ahead and read it. And then uh, with your indulgence, I'll just make a couple of comments in support of it and rest of the discussion. Move to adopt the FMAP PDT's recommendation to remove the predetermined measures concept from further consideration under the biological reference point approach and the biomass based matrix approach alternatives, making that motion for both the board and the council. And we like that. Yeah, so I, again, I, I do support this and uh, wouldn't be making the motion if I didn't. Uh, as per some of the other comments I heard, I do think there's the potential for this to essentially move both of these approaches to essentially more robust versions of the percent change approach. Uh, I'm not sure that's necessarily a bad thing, um, but I think definitely consideration will have to be what those become. And, and if, in fact, that's what they become, I would encourage the FMAT to come to that conclusion sooner versus later and then work towards essentially one consolidated option that they're bringing forward to us with sub options within it. Say, OK, this is now the big picture of what we're looking at and then ways that we would go ahead and deviate from that. 
Um, along those same lines, uh, I would support the comments that we heard about uh, the biomass trend. Some of these approaches already do have it. I would support the FMAT looking at a way to incorporate biomass trend into the percent change approach moving forward. And I also think it might be helpful given the comments we've heard today during discussions, concerns about uh, recreational harvest targets compared to the RHL um, borrowing. I think it would be helpful if perhaps the FMAC could do some work with regards to giving us information on what exact the impacts have been of recreational RHL exceedances. Because from where I'm sitting, those recreational RHL exceedances, and I think Ms. Wilkie made a great point earlier today, that when you have those exceedances, but yet the stock is not responding negatively, that says that either those exceedances are just on paper or aren't really occurring, or that our targets are really out of whack. But the reality is, is that all of those recreational high harvests feed into the assessment which have ultimately, we saw it dramatically a few years ago with the MRIP re-estimates result in higher ABCs and higher commercial quotas. So I think if some work could be done on saying, okay, what have these RHL exceedances actually resulted in other than identifying that there appears to be a disconnect between catches and quotas, as well as resulting in higher ABCs, I think it would be very helpful as we continue to frame this discussion and then inform us what our true concerns should be about the issue around the table. Any more discussion on the motion? Joe, I believe it's the board's turn to go first. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is, is there any need for a caucus from the board? Looks like it, so I'll, I'll, I'll give a uh, minute and a half, John. Okay. Okay, based on the positive nature of the discussion so far, I'm, I'm just going to ask, is there any objection from the board to passing this motion? Okay, not seeing any, it'll, it passes the board unanimously. Well, we're going to try the same motion then with the council. Is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, is there any sentence from the motion? Seeing none, the motion passes unanimously. Julia Trace here, Chelsea, anything else to bring before us? All righty, thank you very much. We're going to move on, and I guess that ends the joint meeting with the Policy Board and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. We are done for the day. We're going to be back to a council-only meeting now. Go ahead and go to our next agenda item. The guidance document for council review for exempted fishing permit applications for unmanaged forage amendment ecosystem and component species. Julie, I'll give you a minute to get the presentation up and the floor is yours when you're ready. Uh, 
All right, so switching to a different topic. Um, so you may recall back in October, the council reviewed a document related to a council process for review of exempted fishing permit or EFP applications for the species listed as ecosystem components under the forage amendment. Um, during that meeting, the council re recommended some additional revisions. So subsequently, those revisions were made by staff and then sent the document, the revised document out to the ecosystem and ocean planning advisory panel and committee for review with track changes and an explanation of um, why the council wanted the specific changes that they recommended. And then the APN committee provided additional feedback over email. Um, so I'll summarize all that. I'll summarize um, the changes that were made between October and now, including a reminder of um, what the council asked for and then some additional revisions recommended by the APN committee. And then the council will be asked to approve the revised document. So I'm not planning to go into detail on the whole document because that was covered during the October meeting, but I'm going to focus just on the changes that have been made um, since October. So I guess, first of all, reminding you of the purpose of this whole document. Um, again, this relates to the forage amendment. The goal of the forage amendment was to prohibit the development of new and expansion of existing directed commercial fisheries for unmanaged forage species until the council has had an adequate opportunity to assess the scientific information related to any new or expanded directed fisheries and consider potential impacts to existing fisheries fishing communities and the marine ecosystem. So that's all stated in this document um, and to you know, state that this is the goal of the forage amendment and any exempted fishing permits related to the forage amendment species need to comply with this goal. So the way that the forage amendment went about attempting to achieve that goal was to implement a 1700 pound commercial pet possession limit for um, several species that were listed as ecosystem components and the forage amendment also specified that an exempted fishing permit is required as a first step towards considering allowing landings beyond those 1700 pounds because um, as you recall from the previous slide the goal statement is not to prohibit these um, directed fishing um, effort um, indefinitely but rather until the council has had the adequate opportunity to consider scientific information and the relevant impacts. So the, again, the EFP is the first step towards um, considering those impacts. And then um, as part of the 2024 implementation plan, the council wanted to kind of further define what goes into the council review um, of those EFPs. So again, the purpose of this document is to kind of lay out the process for council review of EFP applications for these forage amendment species to communicate the council's priorities for those species, to outline the information that the council would like to see to inform their review of the EFP applications. And just to clarify, this was discussed in October, but we tried to make it even more clear in the new document, the revised document, that this council document does not modify or replace the federal process for review and um, considerations regarding approval and issuance of EFPs and it's not binding on the National Marine Fisheries Service. And that um, kind of leads into some of the changes that were requested by the council in October. The biggest change is that the uh, document is now titled a guidance document for council review of these EFPs. It was previously described as a policy and process document. Um, the council requested um, changing it to be called a guidance document and some other changes in the document to help get at this idea to of like better clarifying the role of the council and GARFO in terms of these specific EFPs that um, still ultimately only GARFO has the authority to approve or disapprove EFPs for these species. So hopefully the document tries to make it, you know, make that even more clear than it was before. Um, the council can request that EFP applicants follow the council review process, but um, they can't require a separate process than what's required under the federal regulations. They can only request it. Um, council can provide input um, into GARFO's decision regarding approving EFPs or not. And the council review can set the stage for future council consideration of management changes that may be requested after the 
EFP is complete, if the applicant, the ultimate goal of the applicant is to consider developing a longer term directed fishery, then this council review process can be helpful um, to set the stage for council consideration of that. So hopefully the changes in document try to make all of that more clear, um, the role of the council versus GARFO. And again, the biggest change um, in that regard is reframing it as a guidance document. But you can see in the briefing materials, there's a track changes version of the document where there was a few um, other sections where there was additional language to kind of just repeat that point a few times. Um, so next, I will summarize the input that the EOP committee and AP provided over email. Um, there was general support for the revisions. So uh, the AP and committee were in, they provided with the revised document and they were told, if you don't respond to this email, we're going to assume that you're okay with these changes. Um, so several people did not respond, but five committee members spoke up to say that they supported the revisions and eight AP members also responded to say they supported the revisions. Um, one AP member um, was opposed to the document kind of generally, not the revision specifically, but just the process um, more broadly. This AP member preferred that EFP applications instead be sent to the council as a courtesy after they have been submitted to GARFO and that the council should wait to review applications until after GARFO announces that the application is complete and warrants further consideration. So that's the stage at which the Federal Register notice is published. What the document actually suggests is that there will be multiple stages of a council review before that point. But this advisor thought that the council should wait to get um, too involved until the GARFO has announced that the application is complete and warrants further consideration and a Federal Register notice is published. This advisor um, cited the recent Threadfin Herring EFP application as an example of an application having a lengthy review process and requiring multiple changes before it can get to the point where GARFO determines that it's complete. So the, this advisor thought it would just be more efficient to wait until that step before the council gets involved. Um, one AP member recommended that GARFO issue guidance to EFP applicants to help clarify that there's, this advisor described it as two paths forward, that the application can proceed with the council review process or they can proceed without it. However, there are some reasons why an applicant would um, benefit from uh, going through the council review process, even though it's not required, and that GARFO could play a role in helping applicants understand um, why that would be important. Um, and the AP member thought that Council review is especially important when the ultimate goal of the EFP is consideration of a larger directed fishery, um, but it might not be so important if it's a smaller scale, more academic study. Um, one committee member provided additional edits regarding the reports um, after an EFP is completed and nobody expressed opposition to these edits over email, so they've been incorporated into the track changes document as well. And since these were this topic was brought up during the October um, meeting, but um, more details were provided in the revised version. So I'll just kind of walk through specifically what the changes are. So at the end of the document, um, there's a section that says that applicants must submit a report on the outcome of the EFP. Um, and now there's just a lot more detail on what that report should contain. So it's, um, just briefly, it says it should describe all of the species caught including the amount um, and dispositions, including if it was landed or discarded. There should be a description of the probable impacts of the fishing effort authorized under the EFP on a variety of um, aspects that the council cares about. So those are all listed on the screen here. Won't read them all out loud, but this language um, in terms of everything that's listed here is a combination of things that the council prioritized through the forage amendment and things that are required under the federal regulations already in terms of things that the impacts um, should be considered for. Um, the, re the report of the EFP should also include a description of the gear used, any specific fishing strategy employed to target the desired species, as well as any gear modifications and fishing strategies to reduce bycatch or reduce environmental impacts. The report should also contain recommendations for revising the EFP to provide better information in the future. Um, or ways to modify the fishing activities to improve catch, reduce bycatch, or otherwise improve fishing efficiency. 
and it should include conclusions regarding whether the fishing activities provide necessary information for determining the next steps. Um, and the document previously indicated that um, EFP reports should be provided within six months of completing the exempted fishing activity. That's already required under the federal regulations. The revised document includes some additional language to say that um, if there's an application to renew an EFP, that a report on the previous EFP should be provided as part of the renewal application. And that it just indicates that that six month time frame, it might be helpful to provide a report even sooner if the report is needed to process a renewal application um, to help the review process um, go quicker for applications that request a review. Um, and then during the email exchange with the AP and the committee, there was a question about um, how this document changes what the council adopted through the forage amendment. And this was discussed uh, a little bit um, during the October council meeting, and it has been noted in this draft document, both the October version and this current version. But since it was a question that came up, I thought it'd be helpful to kind of remind you all about it now that um, under the forage amendment, the council agreed that the count that you wanted to review the relevant EFP applications before GARFO reviews them. But the proposed new process is that the council and GARFO will work together to review the applications concurrently. This was discussed in October that um, we thought that this would be beneficial um, to kind of share expertise and work together on this instead of the council reviewing it first and then GARFO. Um, and then, so the question that came up was, can this change be made without a formal management action since it's changing something that was adopted through the forage amendment? And the staff perspective on this is yes, this change can be made without something like a framework because this part of the forage amendment is not included in the federal regulations. And it does still align with the intent of the forage amendment because the, the way it's laid out is the doc, in the document is that the council is requesting that um, GARFO not publish the federal register notice announcing a public comment period on the EFPs until certain steps of the council review process has been completed. Um, so it still aligns with the intent of the forage amendment um, in that the council would still be able to carry out their review before the GARFO process is fully complete. It's just that the GARFO process could start before the council um, finishes their review. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to acknowledge that there was um, one comment letter provided for the briefing book for this meeting um, that was signed on by 11 organizations who expressed support for the updated document. And they recommended the council approve this document during this meeting with no further revisions, um, which is basically the question putting to you all today. Um, the objective again is for you all to consider if to um, approval of this document and if any additional revisions are needed. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Any questions or comments for Julia? I see none around the table and none online. I believe you have a motion ready to put up on the board. Michelle Duvall, would you like to make this motion? Yes, I would, Mr. Chair. Um, right. And Mike Luisi is going to second it. Michelle, would you like to read this long motion into the minutes, please? Thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. I move to approve. If we could scroll up a little bit. Can I change the language? Um, I still have the word policy and process document and that um, it was the old language. I'm sorry. It should say guidance document. Um, Stephen, can you scroll a little bit? 
There we go. So move to approve the guidance document as presented today. And I just want to take the opportunity to thank Julia for her, you know, one woman show of hard work getting us through this process and also express my thanks to all of the committee and advisory panel members who participated in this. I think it was we've we achieved our objective and I think it was it was a successful process. So thanks to to Julia and everybody else. Any more discussion on the motion? Okay, Wilkie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Kate Wilkie with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, I just wanted to express my gratitude and appreciation for all of the work that went into this guidance document and uh, to draft and finalize it. Um, thank you to Michelle as the chair of the EOP and um, having this well-defined guidance will provide the opportunity for proponents of increased harvest on, on forage species to have thorough communication with uh, the council and, and thorough review of the council. So uh, thank you, that's all. Let's see if we can make this motion quite easy. Is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, is there any abstention for the motion? Seeing none, the motion passes by unanimous consent. Julia, anything else? Are we good? All right, thank you very much for the presentation. Let's go on to our final agenda item before lunch. Uh, the council received a presentation covering ROSA strategic plan activities and steps to support the council's offshore wind efforts. Renee Riley, executive director of ROSA. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I totally understand that I'm the last thing before lunch, so I hope to not use the full time and give people some extra time. So. Nice to meet you all. And um, if you don't know me already, my name is Renee Riley. I'm the new executive director at the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance. Um, just wanted to take the opportunity to introduce or reintroduce the organization to all of you. My deep apologies to Eric, John, anyone else who had to hear this because absolutely zone out for the next 15, 20 minutes. Uh, it is the pleasure of our organization to have had the opportunity to speak to the New England Council and uh, hopefully in the future talking at South Atlantic. So um, for those of you who might not know, the mission of our organization is to advance the research and monitoring around the effects of offshore wind development on fisheries across US federal and state waters. Um, our aim is to really serve as an objective resource for all the sectors involved in this landscape and facilitate coordination around regional research. So on the left, you see our four pillars, our guiding principles are to be scientific, objective, collaborative, and transparent in all that we do. And just to show you a bit of the history and uh, structure of the organization, really ROSA was born out of um, this conversation between the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, which is a coalition of commercial fisher folk and also some offshore wind developers who deeply agreed that science was the best way to move forward decision making in this new space. And um, so ROSA was born out of a need to coordinate research regionally around these issues. So you see on the screen our organizational structure. We are led by a board of directors that's currently comprised of both fishing industry representatives as well as offshore wind developers. So there's some fun uh, inherent kind of different perspectives baked in at that level. I do want to note, uh, take this opportunity to say we will be expanding the board of directors to include some unaffiliated members as well. Um, if you're interested in that, please find me after today's talk um, and we'll be moving that forward in the early part of 2024. So at the core of our organizational structure is our advisory council. That's our main representative body. All of the leaseholders in the US um, sit on that advisory council as well as representatives from both the commercial and recreational sectors, uh, regulators at the federal and state level, uh, folks from the councils as well. So thank you for all of you who volunteer your time to help us uh, with strategic direction and setting priorities. 
We also have a group of research advisors. This is our independent scientific group that has subject matter expertise. And from those two, we create area and topic committees for specific tasks. Um, so just to kind of lay out why we exist, there is obviously a really complicated or diverse group of folks working on offshore wind fisheries work. Um, and there's a various number of funding sources, research institutions and organizations, as well as different data infrastructures that really depend on who is asking the scientific question. So this includes things like at the top, offshore wind developers, fisheries monitoring plans. Um, on the side, the regional research and monitoring programs that are uh, stood up like New Jersey's Offshore Wind Research and Monitoring Initiative, uh, the program opportunity notices from NYSERDA, et cetera, as well as individual projects like Project WOW, um, the great work that's being done at uh, Chesapeake Bay Lab, OMSIs, et cetera. And then on the left in what you probably can't see because it's in yellow, <laughs> but also opportunities that are more the regional scale stuff, like the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative for Offshore Wind um, and Rock Marco. And so ROSA is uniquely so situated at the center of all of those things, right? And so a lot of the scientific questions cross those different either funding sources or organizations, but there isn't a whole lot of coordination happening just yet. And so um, right now, our organization is poised to enter a new phase, um, and because of that, we are developing a new strategic plan. That's what I came to talk to you all about today. Um, it's going to include our history and vision, but also a, a roadmap for the next five years. So it sort of links how our guiding principles are going to inform our three strategic goals for the next five years. Um, and before, you know, it concludes, we kind of describe what steps we'll be taking to actually realize those goals. Um, but we did include our, our organizational structure and our ongoing initiatives as appendices as well in the strategic plan. So I just wanted to step through those briefly with you so you understand really what we're focused on for the next few years. Um, the first of our strategic goals in the roadmap is to coordinate offshore wind fisheries research and monitoring. And I do recognize that that's a vague statement, um, but what I hope to demonstrate is some of the ways that we're doing that. So to address that first strategy, um, we have developed a database that is called Fish Forward. There is no A in it. Um, I do wanna give credit to Mike Pohl, our research director for creating a lot of this content. So if you're mad at it, you can talk to Mike. Um, but, uh, the, the goal of the database is to synthesize the existing research priorities that have been set by the various organizations that um, I listed earlier. That, you know, lots of different folks have priority lists and they depend on who is setting those priorities, right? So a state has a different priority list than a regional organization. Um, the second function of the database is to compile research that's currently happening to address those priorities. So by analyzing those two lists, you essentially are able to get at what are the gaps in research that need to be still addressed. So that is going to help our organization specifically, but also others in the space to inform future research prioritization. Um, we, it does already exist. It's published on our website right now in the form of a kind of janky database that's in Excel. Um, if you're not a big fan of Excel and you don't like making your own pivot tables, we are currently developing a more user-friendly web tool. This will be a dashboard. It'll show the number of priorities, how many have been met, where the data gaps currently are. Um, and we are looking to secure funding for regular updates to the database. So um, if you have thoughts about that, find me also. So the second um, item I wanted to highlight under this first strategy is that ROSA is hosting a series, if you have not heard about them already, um, our offshore wind fisheries monitoring plan development, implementation and evolution series, very catchy name. We're launching those uh, next week actually with some virtual sessions. There's going to be sector specific ses sessions so that we can provide neutral space for these conversations around coordination. There's a lot of talk and not a whole lot of actual doing of coordination, right? And so the very first step is to 
document inconsistencies across plans, identify not only the challenges, but also potential solutions. So we're going to hold those sessions um, virtually for developers, regulators, and the science and research community next week. And then an in-person session is now scheduled. We're sending out an announcement shortly, uh, directly preceding NOAA's Cooperative Research Summit, which is going to be held in February in Cape May, New Jersey. The summary from those sessions is going to be um, created into or put into a, summarized in a report that we will be um, going over and, and discussing and holding a session around at the State of the Science workshop in July that NYSERDA is hosting in Long Island. That one is going to be all inclusive and open to all sectors so that we can kind of get the ball rolling on what we need to do to create greater coordination across these types of plans. And this is specific, just to be clear, to the project specific monitoring plans. The second strategy for our five year roadmap is to facilitate assessment of regional and cumulative impacts. This is something that's really a big topic um, that again, I think ROSA is uniquely situated to move forward. I do wanna highlight there's kind of two buckets of work that you can think of regional research. The first is regional research programs. These are essentially what I'm calling the, the kind of funds that are created through PPAs that are designed to get at regional assessments. So um, each state has a different procurement process and a different power purchase agreement process, but a lot of states are including funding requirements for regional research. That's what we mean by that first bucket. And then the second bucket is this idea of a regional monitoring plan for fish and fisheries. These tools that require larger scale coordination, for example, acoustic telemetry or eDNA, where you want to look at things from a basin wide perspective. We're not at all saying that there should be plans that are going to replace project specific monitoring, but we do need to build some synergies and create some efficiencies to ensure that we get at these more regional capital R regional uh, assessments. To, to dive a little deeper on why that matters. Right now, the fisheries monitoring plans are being developed with really high frequencies of extractive sampling. Um, it's kind of creating this tension because there's increased mortality when you're doing a whole lot of extractive sampling. You're actually creating some increased risk to protected species. There's been a lot of challenges with permitting. There's creating this tension essentially between monitoring the resource and protecting it. And so that is one of the kind of problems with the status quo. It, additionally, only one year of pre-construction data is, is technically required or to date has been approved. And so baselines that are comparing kind of before and after are, are not gonna really be established. And that's been documented in papers that have come out recently. So obviously there's a need to assess regional impacts, but the methods to do that are pretty unclear. Um, if we have a more coordinated approach, it'll increase our scientific rigor and efficiency as well as the effectiveness of the work. So we are thinking about potentially either combining lease areas into one regional study area or looking at, you know, in the New York Bay, for example, where there's contiguous leases, how can we make sure that the plans that are being proposed are consistent across those? Fine-scale lease monitoring for certain leases sources is likely always going to be needed. We don't necessarily need the same tools all the way from Maine to Kitty Hawk, but there is likely going to be a movement towards two tiers of monitoring to address both the regional questions as well as project specific impacts. There's been a lot of interest from fishing industry to be able to assess cumulative impacts. There's been interest from the developer side to increase efficiencies. Obviously, again, on the scientific community side, interest in assessing those regional impacts. And finally, if we can streamline the regulatory process, um, agencies are really interested in that as well. So a quick example is acoustic telemetry that I mentioned earlier. This is really common in a lot of fisheries monitoring plans that have been proposed already. Um, and there's folks, a few key practitioners that are essentially executing the work, right? So there's some built in uh, consistency if you have the same contractor doing the work across multiple leases, but we want to make this more formal. And so um, if you're aware of the example of passive acoustic monitoring for cetaceans, for example, 
uh, network was proposed, put out in the published literature, so that as individual funding sources are coming up with where they want to put these receivers, they can point to a grid and kind of play a game of battleship and say, I'm going to put a receiver here. I know that there's others here so that we can get at a more um, intentional approach. And finally, we're working to collaborate with folks at BOEM, NIMS, of course, across the states and the developers to understand how this could fulfill requirements and help mitigate impacts to the surveys. There's a lot of interest, but moving forward, it's going to really require broad input as well as buy-in and collaboration. And then the final uh, strategic goal in the five-year roadmap is to maintain ROSA's project monitoring framework and guidelines. This was published in March of 2021, but the only way that a document like this is useful is if it's up to date and maintained. And so we want to create alignment across projects in experimental designs, tools and methods, as well as data sharing, um, analysis and governance. So we're going to use the outcomes from the coordination sessions to inform the updates to this document. This is really going to be a big goal of the organization is kind of coming up with solutions that are co-created across sectors. And I just want to note very plainly that obviously there's still a lot in that original framework document that needs to be published. So the benthic habitat and monitoring studies, as well as the socioeconomic monitoring studies, those sections of this framework document essentially were TBD. So a lot has happened since March of 2021, and we plan to update and reflect that in um, this guidance document. So a little clicker is working. Okay. Really, I'm coming to you all to hopefully talk about how we can streamline communications about offshore wind research. We want to support the existing and upcoming efforts that the councils are having in the research space um, so that we can involve data streams from multiple developers and really be a one-stop shop for folks that need mechanisms for addressing scientific questions. Um, our, our goal is to provide service to the broader community. And again, just thanks for the chance to speak to you today. We really are committed to producing a bridge across sectors, promoting science-based discourse around co ocean co-use, and supporting solutions that realize the important goal of, of equity. So I appreciate everyone's time. I hope that we have uh, some, we have time for questions, but also just everyone enjoys their lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Renee. You can breathe now. You didn't take too many breaths in that presentation. Is there any questions or comments? Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Renee, for the great presentation and um, definitely looking forward to participating in the regional workshops that you'll be hosting, I think, starting next week. And so I know those are focused more about um, project specific guidelines and you know updating folding those into your current guidelines you know given also the focus of rosa on trying to help coordinate this regional approach would you anticipate some you know maybe an additional section in the checklist or something with perhaps some guidance on how to think about um, monitoring programs when they're being developed that would you know, allow for them to be integrated more regionally? Would you anticipate that being part of this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the good news is that a lot of the tools are consistent, whether you're talking about a project specific plan or if you're talking about a regional approach. So we're definitely hoping that we're going to fold that in um, and that will be part of the updated guidelines. Yeah. John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Renee. Um, is Rosa looking into, I mean, obviously, most of the focus right now is about siting the, uh, the turbines offshore, but uh, one of the concerns that we have in Delaware is that the onshoring of the cables, the um, a couple of the projects want to come right through our inland bays and to get to a substation. I heard the same thing happen with uh, Barnegat Bay with the projects that were canceled off in New Jersey. Is Rosa looking at the the fisheries impacts of the onshoring of the cables as well as the placement of the turbines themselves? Yeah, great question. Um, we 
you know, in right in our mission are are hoping to address concerns around both, you know, state and federal fisheries. So yes, I I would say the idea is to make sure that we're promoting consistency. Um, and that's certainly a concern that's not just unique to your your question. I think we hopefully will provide guidance um, that's going to address inshore as well as offshore questions. Peter Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Renee. Um, we've met, not gonna lie. <laughs> when you speak about funding sources, um, can you go a little more in depth and, and talk about partnerships with, do we have any um, buoys with anybody for funding sources and states providing funding and what, what, what your aspirations are for funding? Yeah, thanks. So as a nonprofit, um, it's really important that we have a diverse funding stream. And right now, um, initial seed funding for the organization was provided through a group of kind of legacy offshore wind developer um, organizations. Uh, ongoing funding is uh, essentially a mix of the folks who have better releases right now, um, states. So right now, the states of uh, New York, New Jersey, and Maryland are supporting ROSA. We are looking to expand that. You've probably heard from me if you're a state rep. Um, so. <laughs> We hope that we can get everyone at least pitching in because there's broad agreement that the organization needs to exist and that the function is important and we're looking to expand our um, sponsors. We are also working on um, some new communication strategy. We're staffing up this year, getting a communication staff to get a strategic communications plan in place. Um, part of that is to make our sponsorship more uh, visible. You can, of course, go. Uh, on the government website and find our financials, but we want to make it very clear who's supporting the organization and that we have broad buy-in. Um, obviously, the fishing industry folks are, you know, dedicating their time in kind support um, as well. And so we're looking to um, not only have our operational budget covered that way through sponsorships, but we also right now have secured our first contract with a developer to create a regional research program and that's with Equinor. Um, they essentially are gonna be working with the RWSC and ROSA to administer their regional funding that was created through their power purchase agreement with the state of New York. So that will create a fund that is going to be administered through um, ourselves and the RWSC to address more regional scientific offshore wind questions. Um, does that answer your question, Peter? It does, and then I have one more. Maybe in left field, out of left field. Sorry about that. Can you tell me a little bit about the work with RWSC, uh, and Rock and Marco, and how how that um, how Rosa interacts with those? Are there any partnerships there? Are there are there collaborations there? So sorry to put you under the. No, that's great. It's you know didn't want to take too much time. I could talk about for for quite a bit all the work that we're doing. Um, so we kind of work in two different ways with the folks at RWSC. Um, we serve on both protected species subcommittee as well as um, the habitat subcommittee and the newly formed technology subcommittee. Um, and then we also meet with them monthly to essentially keep one another aligned in what we're doing. Um, the folks at NROC are involved in those conversations as well and Marco. Um, so a couple of initiatives that I didn't want to take too much time, but a couple of initiatives specifically we're working with um, the regional councils on our um, tribal engagement, how we can be more intentional about how we're uh, involving other partners in the work. Um, and so we have some ongoing initiatives with NROC and Marco right now, um, as well as some folks at the EPA to make sure that we're moving forward appropriately in that space as well. Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Megan Lapp, Seafreeze. Um, Renee, I had a question. So I noticed in your presentation, you talked a lot about the telemetry studies. And I know that that's like ongoing and it's, you know, it's been there for a while. Are you working with, 
the developers um, and any future initiatives to ensure that they get all the appropriate permits for that. Um, like Army Corps Nationwide Permit 5, um, every like all the, the scientific equipment like hydrophones and stuff are supposed to have those permits. Um, and in the past, what we have experienced essentially um, is that there were developers working with academic institutions, things like that. Um, and they just dumped hydrophones everywhere. Um, some of them with 500 pound concrete blocks and they put them into the middle of a squid fishery and a vessel almost capsized. Um, and so when they were questioned, they had not gotten any permits for those. I know that some of the, the newer material that they're putting out there has like 75 pound weights on it and stuff like that. But um, I think, you know, getting Obviously, if, if they're supposed to get permits for those, um, I don't know who is and who isn't. Um, and the other issue is with all of those telemetry studies, um, you know, now it's like everybody and their brother is throwing hydrophones in the ocean, and that's creating an issue for mobile gear fisheries. Um, and is there work to deconflict that so that, you know, vessels aren't tearing up their nets and towing up hydrophones everywhere they go? Thanks, Megan. Yeah, I think to the permitting question, no, I don't think that it's our place necessarily to be involved in the permitting process. What I will say is permitting issues are at the core of a lot of the challenges. And so what we're providing hopefully is for a, like the monitoring sessions to have that conversation document that um, and we're doing it by sector so we can hopefully have a really transparent conversation and and pull out the pieces that are a concern for each sector and document it and then come back and publicly say, here's what we're going to do about that, right? Because it's there's been a whole lot of talk, but not maybe so much, okay, well, what's the solution to that? And so we're hoping that this is a first step, right? Like the sessions are probably going to have to continue, but in this first step, we can document challenges like that, um, challenges that the scientific community is having, getting, you know, permitting issues, not those that you just described, but others like, you know, protected species issues and things like that. So I think a very first step is get that out in a report so that we can talk about how do we address those problems? Um, are we gonna in, like intercede? No, like we are a science organization and we wanna stay in our lane. Um, but in terms of, are we supporting deconflicting, you know, location of the scientific gear? Absolutely, because the only way that you can do that is by, you know, gathering input from each of the people trying to use the space and say, here's what we're trying to do. Let's talk about it before we do it. Um, I can't go up back retroactively and fix that, but we can do things differently moving forward. That'd be great um, if you could raise those issues. I appreciate it. Thank you. I see no more hands. Renee, thank you very much. And with that, we'll adjourn for lunch and we'll see everybody back here at one o'clock. All right, thank you.